get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And uh, before I introduce today's guest, Chris Clark of Digital Ignite, uh, Chris, I always like to mention past episodes people should check out. You know, I've had some really interesting guests over the past, over decade, you know, the founder of RX Bars, P90X. But what I love uh, is the companies people have never heard of that are doing really cool things and cool niches, um, and especially in the agency world. So I had... um, You know, Wes Matthews on the podcast who talks about selling his agency with the help of Todd Tasky and and how he navigated that. It was really interesting. He built his company, I think, up to over five million dollars, six million dollars and sold it. And um, but he sold it and he stayed on, which I thought was interesting. He didn't sell it in like retirement island. He stayed on and because he loves what he does and just kept doing what he normally does, except without all the he had a management infrastructure with the new company. So that was great. John Morris talked about growing his agency from, you know, to 250 people before he sold it. John Doherty of Credo talks about helping agencies avoid bad hiring. So check out those many, many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships by helping them run their podcast. And, you know, for me, Chris, you know me a little bit, The number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking a way to give to my relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to do that by having a podcast profiling the people and the companies I love, I admire. I want to learn more from personally. I want my audience to learn more from. And um, it's amazing. You know, know, I'm going to South Carolina in a couple of months. I met Chris. Chris is in South Carolina. He's already given me some uh, recommendations. So you just you will break bread with people at some point, you know? So I love it. I've had best friends come from the podcast where we go on vacations together. So you just never know all the the great benefits of having it. So if you've thought about it, you can go to rise25.com, email us. We've been doing it, like I said, for over 10 years, happy to answer any questions you have. I'm excited about today's guest, Chris Clark. He's CMO and managing partner at Digital Ignite. You could check it out at digital-ignite.com. They're an advertising agency, not just any advertising agency. You know, Chris and I were talking before we record and they are really powered by data um, and they do things differently. So we'll talk about what that looks like. And they're based in Charleston, South Carolina. They've helped clients ranging from grocery stores, frozen pizza brands, vacuum cleaner brands, kitchenware, even minor league baseball teams. So it spans the gamut. You know, thank you, Chris, for joining me. Hey, thank you so much, Jeremy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's exciting to be chatting. I know we've you know talked briefly over the last uh, you know month. I'm excited for you to get down to Charleston. Um, it's scorching hot here right now. So uh, if if any of the listeners have been to Charleston between July and August, it's it's unbearable. But we do live in fantasy land. It's it's an amazing place. Plenty of beaches. Plenty of amazing food, drinks, and all of that. So uh, excited to get you down here so we can you know at least. Uh, I know you've got it planned out. Uh, I know you said your wife's kind of got it all sketched out. <laughs> exactly. Those, but um, I'll definitely give you some good spots and some barbecue, some good late night, some dive bars if you like it. And um, I know we briefly spoke on baseball. So hopefully the River Dogs are in town while you're here too and get you over there. Let's start with the River Dogs. Yeah, yeah. I would love to go to a minor league. I mean, my dream growing up um, when I was younger was to be a catcher for the Cubs. And then it turned into a chiropractor for the Cubs and then turned it into just hitting back to batting practice on Wrigley field, but <clears throat> the river dogs. Yeah. What, are, what did you do with the river dogs? So, okay. Yeah. The river dogs are a single a baseball team here in Charleston. They are uh, owned by going back to the Chicago Cubs in the Chicago area, uh, Mike Beck. So if you are um, sure, uh, I remember he's a pitcher, Mike, he's a pitcher for the Cubs, right? No, no, no. So his dad, his dad, um, I can't remember his if it was Mike Beck Sr., but his dad did, uh, actually, I think was instrumental in putting lights at Wrigley. So, oh, really? Okay. I'm thinking of a different Beck. It was Mr. Yeah, Flake. Yeah, yeah. So, and then Mike Beck was instrumental in the, I think it was the Demolition Disco Night. 
back in like the, the, the 70s, late 70s or whatever. I believe it was in Detroit or, or Chicago or whatnot. Um, again, I'm 32, so forgive me. But I, I nerd out on that stuff. But he owns the River Dogs with uh, Bill Murray, uh, believe it or not. Oh, so, I love it. Really? Yeah. yeah. So Chicago. He's ties. a huge Chicago Cubs fan. Absolutely. So Chicago ties down here in Charleston, um, you know, they own a couple other baseball teams across the country. Um, I believe the St. Paul team, uh, minor league team up in Minnesota, but yeah. So the river dogs have been one of our clients for almost six years now. Um, and we have, have really helped them, you know, go from a, and, and for us, they're amazing because they really sell themselves. Um, if you're not familiar with them or minor league sports, um, you had spoke about wanting to work for the Cubs or play in sports. That's, that's kind of my, that was my dream. I wanted to play baseball. Uh, Ken Griffey Jr. Derek Jeter were like my idols growing up. And I, once I realized what, what position were you? So I was, so I'm left-handed and when you're left-handed in little league, you only get to do two things. One, they force you to be a pitcher because there's not a lot of lefties. And then two, uh, they put you in the outfield and I'm not tall enough to play first base. So I was going to say first base is a, is a common one too. Yeah. So I got to be in center field, which when I was a little kid, I didn't really get it. Cause I was like, you know what? F this, I can, I'm a shortstop. I want to be Derek Jeter, but you know, I, I, I quickly learned, okay, I, I'm fast. I can, I can cover the gaps. So, you know, I'll, I'll play, I'll play center field. And then I learned how to throw a curveball. <laughs> and so in, in Little League, you know, you can definitely strike some kids out with a curveball, but when you get up higher, it doesn't work out that well when you don't have speed. So can't hang too many curveballs, uh, you know, when you're when you're in middle school and high school. So uh, back to the outfield I went. But other than that, you know, it wasn't that great at, at, at baseball to get to the next level. Love it to death, though. But um, it, driv- it, it drove me to want to be a, a journalist or uh, be in sports somehow. So I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, and my mom and dad, my mom is in advertising. So that is why I, I feel like I'm, I'm in this. I was either going to be in advertising or the military. That's where my dad is. Uh, the whole, whole majority of my family is military and hmm. love the military, respect it. But for me, a uh, very creative driven person. But my dad, when he was in the Marines, as a side gig was uh, my uncle ran the grounds crew for a team called the Salem Buccaneers. And if we're going to nerd out on baseball, uh, they're in Bull Durham. They were a Carolina league team mm. that played the, the Durham Bulls back in the day. They're now the Salem Red Sox, which I hate the Red Sox. Uh, it stinks that the hometown team is the Red Sox. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he was, he just helped out grounds crew. So I literally hung out in, in this shed as a little kid while they were like taking care of the the lawn, but like uh, you know, pitchers like Tim Wakefield were there. Moises Alou was playing there, uh, so got to like meet you know a lot of random baseball players that went on to the major leagues, and it just really got you know stuck in into my blood. But um, from there, you know, I I went into work in minor league teams and and all of that. But you know, I got to achieve my dream of working in minor league sports, learn the long hours and the low pay. Uh, so got that out of the way and that's why I'm in the agency world, but coming full circle to working with the river dogs, you know, minor league sports, you're there for the entertainment value. You're not there necessarily for the, the, the on-field, uh, performance per se. You could be there. I mean, if you're a, a really big sports nerd, why not? But, uh, unless there's some players that are growing, going up to the next level or coming down to rehab, you're not really there to watch those players. You're there for thirsty Thursdays which the river dogs do really well, dollar beer night. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're there for dropping uh, thousands of bouncy balls out of helicopter to see which one lands closest to home plate to win like a car or a certain amount of money. You know, I and, love that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You're there. What to are watch- some of the other creative marketing stuff? I feel like the minor league teams are, are really creative at that. Well, so yeah, exactly. That's where, that's where, you know, you've got to drive people into it. You know, the, the river dogs have like a DJ up, up on the, uh, you know, grandstand up top um you know they just had a a, a promotion where uh, it was toilet paper night so they they made fun of you know COVID, <laughs> and then they rolled the whole the whole stadium afterwards so the players after the game you know they're sitting there just chucking toilet toilet paper everywhere um you know and so for that we live in a town um that is tourist driven you know we've charleston's been the number one city in the country uh 10 out of I've been here 11 years. I think it's been number one or number two in Condé Nast like every year. 
Uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing. So <laughs> we are very tiny here. We're on a peninsula. All these people coming in, uh, infrastructure is not that well. But on the flip side, you know, we do get a lot of really uh, unique opportunities with businesses coming in. You know, Volvo's here, Mercedes is here now, uh, Boeing's here. Um, but, you know, with the River Dogs, being able to hit those individuals that, A, have been moving in here at a rapid pace. It's, ha- it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. People aren't aware that there's a baseball team here. And then also you've got the tourists here. So within 25, 30 minutes of, of Charleston, you've got plenty of beach opportunity to hit tourists. Uh, you got little island cities that are around. So uh, our, our job is really to, to, to help educate these individuals that, hey, there's a baseball team here. Because if you're a local, you know the River Dogs. And if you are a baseball fan, you know the River Dogs. So they've got that covered, you know. And so for us, we try to use creative and, and experience driven uh, um, just nostalgia from the river dogs past or, or current season, you know, with our ties to hit these individuals. And so we've put together a, a fully, I mean, a, a full channel marketing campaign for these guys. And so we've worked with them over the last five to six years. And the big thing that we've helped them do is now show transparency in ticket sales. So before this digitally, they were just having um, ads served out there to the masses, maybe just serving it on Google. Um, no, no real strategy behind it, not being able to kind of see what was, what was going on. So, uh, we came in and we installed a, a dynamic, a dynamic pixel that helps us track ticket sales. So we've worked with their ticket provider over the last five to six years to show every ad out every dollar in. And, you know, in certain seasons we've gone, you know, eight to one on, on their return of an investment. So, uh, what we're doing is hitting people in real time. So whether that's people sitting on the beach with their cell phone, because again, it's, you know, that's what you do now, uh, serving an audio ad and the river dogs have very, very amazing creative. We work in tandem with them on that. But if you've got Mike Beck and the individuals there working for that team, they're very creative. And if you put Bill Murray on any type of ad, I mean, game over, people are going to engage with it. So, um, we had the unique opportunity to, to really, really cast this brand, uh, wide out into Charleston, but, but into these niche individuals devices. So we've done uh, pre-roll, we've done connected television with them, streaming audio, display ads, uh, social again is, is massive. And all of this is driving right back into their ticket sales and being able to show that return of investment. I want to hear about how you use data because I know it's different from a lot of different companies in general, but I was thinking of Rod Beck, not Mike Beck. That was uh, the cl- old closer of the, of the Cubs. I was wrong on the Mike Beck. But, but um, the, talk about how you use data, you know, because you're talking about, um, you know, you're able to track on a very granular level, um, but you do this across many different types of campaigns and companies. Yeah. And, you know, and data is that big buzzword. And I know we've been talking about baseball, so I'll throw there's, you know, the asterisk next to data right now. And so um, with that data, you know, we, we want to help educate people because in this space, it's very, very valuable. We believe data is the new oil, but it also is very scary to people because they think that, you know, their data is getting stolen, their data is getting, you know, misused. Um, for us, we do it in a very ethical way. Um, we uh, use multiple kinds of data. So we use first party data, uh, meaning for the river dogs, if it's sales data, um, individuals visiting the website, uh, any, any uh, physical address, um, that zip code right there is, is really our gold mine. Um, any emails, any of those snippets, we don't really use any name data, uh, especially with the way that the world's going, you know, cookies are becoming irrelevant. And so uh, the other side of it is we use third party data. And so that's that little fingerprint that you, you leave behind anywhere you go on the internet. And so companies like Oracle or Google, there's hundreds of them, they silo that data and resell it. So that's third party data. data. And for us, we go to our exchanges through our demand side platforms or our partners, and we can go and select. So for example, if the river dogs want to target soccer moms, I can go and find a soccer mom data set, throw a really creative ad, layer on the Charleston uh, DMA, boom, hit those individuals to say, hey, the river dogs are playing this weekend. Um, so again, data is super valuable for us, um, but we're using uh, encrypted servers to store our data. We're, we're, we're GDPR, very focused on GDPR. 
Um, very focused on, you know, again, cookies becoming irrelevant. Um, Google just pushed it back another year, um, but there's consistently changes happening. And so it's kind of still the wild, wild west, you know, in this, this advertising space right now. Um, but, you know, for us, we're not necessarily the sheriffs, but we're trying to, uh, you know, make sure that we're doing it in an ethical way and, and educating our, our clients with data. But um, how we're using it is, is again, like I mentioned, the little fingerprint, but if I have uh, the River Dogs past purchasers, I can go and create a whole other audience with them called a lookalike audience. So um, if you're in the marketing space, you're, you're familiar with it, but if you're not and you're a business owner and a brand, that data is, is, is like I said, it's, it's a gold mine. So what you're able to do with that is you're able to go and find a whole new audience that basically would be interested in your brand or product because you're, you're utilizing past purchasers of it. So that data right there, we're, we're going out there and we're, again, using our technology to serve a display ad, a video ad, an audio ad to these individuals that are lookalike audiences in real time. And then again, on the flip side, since we have that person's data already, uh, we can go and re-engage with them again. And so that's another strong tactic with the River Dogs is taking past purchasers and being able to upsell them on ticket packages, try to make them uh, season ticket holders, um, showing them new promotions that are coming up. So if, if in the off season, we want to help sell merchandise and with COVID, um, with a minor league team, gosh, a lot of them got crushed or, or are no longer here. The River Dogs stepped up and, and really pushed merchandise and and pushed food. This was awesome. So what they did was they have a, a really, really creative uh, kitchen, uh, I guess, department over there. And so they've got a hot dog called like the home wrecker, which the man versus food dude has come over here. <laughs> what does that look like? Have you tried it before? Oh, oh, it's amazing. And if, if you get to a game, I, I tell anybody, if you go to a River Dogs game, you got to try it out. But it's a foot long hot dog. You basically get to customize it, you know, throw some pimento cheese, some coleslaw. I mean, again, you can go crazy with it, but that's that's personally would be my favorite. Some coleslaw, some pimento cheese on top of it. But um, they pushed their their menu out during COVID. So they were offering, you know, come get your lunch. Uh, they were amazing. Schools in, 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 in Charleston to, to cater lunches for, for underprivileged youth and such. So, um, again, just really, really phenomenal uh, what, what they've been able to do. But being able to help them just push out any type of this advertising, any type of their initiatives, whether it's in season, off season, why they're on the road. Um, being able to use that data has really helped us to, to really branch their brand out. And again, they don't need help because people know the River Dogs, but it is really exciting to, to help take the 55 people a day that move into Charleston and say, hey, there's a baseball team downtown. This is going to be one of the most phenomenal experiences you've ever had at a sporting event. Uh, come check it out, because if you do one time, you're, you're coming back. Yeah, but even if you know they exist, you know, it's always what's top of mind. And it's always, you know, I could, and I know there's lots of restaurants near me, but if once it's, when it's front and center and it's front of me and I'm aware of it, if someone's serving me an ad or whatever it is, that's what's piquing my interest right then and there. So it sounds like they do a great job and you help them really get in front of the right people and they've adapted, they adapted in an amazing way in COVID. I want to talk about the timeshare stuff because it's a very competitive space yeah. for the different companies trying to get, you know, their, um, you know, probably, uh, inventory filled. But before we get to there, I, I want to just, I love what you said. And if there's any other creative ways that, you know, the combination of getting in front of people and creative ways of, of marketing, you mentioned um, the bouncy balls, you mentioned thirsty Thursdays. And I feel like minor league teams are really good at these creative promotions. What are some other creative promotions that you remember helping run, uh, with the river dogs, maybe it's ongoing. Maybe it was a one-time thing. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, I know they've, um, they've done like, Oh gosh, where it's like the soap, like, you know how you have foam parties and stuff like that. There's been like stand foam parties. There's been concerts after the fact, uh, the fireworks are a really big thing because where the river dogs are, uh, the, the stadium's right on the, the Ashley river. Um, so basically from like right field to center field, if you're sitting behind home plate or to basically to the 
third base line, you can see the river. And so fireworks coming up. So that's always been awesome. Uh, shooting it, somebody out of a cannon is always, is always a really cool, uh, really cool thing. Um, they've had people parachute into the stadium. Um, Bill Murray's thrown out the first pitch. I mean, that's always, you know, amazing. It's actually every, every first uh, opening day game, the mayor of the town will throw out the first pitch. And so, uh, Joe Riley was the mayor in Charleston for like, gosh, uh, don't hold me to this, probably 40, 30, 40 years. He was he was the long, longest running mayor uh, in the United States. He's no longer the mayor, but uh, Bill Murray would come out and pick him up and spin him around and like, you know, throw out the first pitch. So um, and I guess, you know, with that, you know, you can see like John Goodman's been there. Uh, Danny McBride lives in Charleston. Um, so you're seeing like There's some celebrities. Yeah, oh, Anthony, Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain was down here, you know, when he was still alive. He came and filled in, filmed an episode in Charleston um, of No Reservations. And he was with Bill Murray and uh, Sean Brock, who is, a, who is a famous chef. He's in Nashville now. Um, but they were at the Waffle House, like Anthony Bourdain had never gone to a Waffle House. So, you know, but so you never know and, and who you'll see. But uh, promotion wise, you know, again, they, they, they run across the gamut. I... You know, I actually worked for a minor league hockey team and, you know, we kind of had our hands slapped by the league on what we could do uh, on the flip side with what the river dogs can do. It's it's awesome. You know, I love that, you know, at the end of the game, the little kids can go run the bases. You know, that always meant so much to me as a little kid, you know, being able to go out with the players before the game and all of that. So they really do make it a, a family fun uh, friendly atmosphere. I love it. So talk to me about what you did for this timeshare company. Yeah. So it's actually um, a coalition. So we work with the American Resort Development Association. Um, and so uh, that's ARDA. And they basically work in, in, in tandem with all of the major players out there, whether it's Marriott, Hilton, Holiday Inn, Disney, Margaritaville. Um, and so what we've done with them over the past couple of years is there's a couple initiatives. So the first one is uh, responsible exit. And so we've worked with them in tandem with these, these different members to help educate individuals that have had negative experiences with timeshare exit companies. And so basically there's a stigma there. Exactly. I was going to say there's that negative connotation when you think of timeshare or anything timeshare related, but on the flip side, if you've ever been to a timeshare or, or owned one or in, in recent you know, or actually not recent, but in, in any time in the last decade plus, they're amazing properties. They're amazing amenities. Uh, these brands that have come in have really changed that stigma to, to the positive. And so on the flip side, you know, with responsible exit, you've got these exit companies out there like timeshare exit team, and there's hundreds of them and they're all in lawsuits right now. They're out there trying to say, and still gunk up that stigma. And so on responsible exit, uh, we're really trying to help target individuals. And this is so, this is how niche it is. We're trying to hit individuals that own a timeshare uh, that may be trying to either get out of it or, you know, for some reason, something happens in their life that they have to get rid of this. And they've got these exit companies out there hassling them or promising them that they can get out of it, taking their money and running. So with responsible exit, they're actually working with these individuals to uh, take these people that have had those negative experiences and guide them to the right uh, district attorneys and right entities within these different coalitions, whether these these big players to help them ethically get out of their timeshare. So, so people um, have been scammed. Basically, they were trying to get out and they got scammed by a company that said they, you know, they could help them exit it and then just take the money and. And there's that's so many it. different cases of it basically going across, you know, the country, but yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of where it's at. And so uh, we've, we've ran a, a really in-depth campaign before this, they were spending a mass amount of dollars on doing just Google AdWords, nothing wrong with Google AdWords, but Google AdWords gets expensive and you're just on one platform within Google. So if you've got all of these major timeshare exit companies out there, guess who's spending all of that money on Google AdWords for just like one specific keyword to get that one click. So we came in and audited what they were doing. And so, uh, you know, again, still using a little chunk of that AdWords budget, we flipped the rest of that budget into a multi-channel approach. So using um, third-party data and then data provided by the, the coalitions out there, we've been able to educate and target these individuals that have been having uh, 
or being hassled by these exit companies. Um, we've been serving um, creative to these people to drive them to a landing page, to fill out this, this quick, quick form uh, to where we'll put them in contact with one of the employees over at Arda to, to help them navigate them back on that journey. Um, so we're using stuff like contextual keyword targeting, which is a, a tactic where it's on the flip side, a little bit cheaper than Google. So, but cheaper is in this case, a little bit better because with contextual keyword targeting, we're hitting individuals that are typing those specific keywords that were still effective on Google, but we're hitting the rest of the internet. So anybody that is typing timeshare exit, how to get out of my timeshare, um, any of those related keywords, we're picking them up with our algorithms across the open internet. And as opposed to just serving that one ad on Google, we're hitting them with display ads, audio ads, and video ads to ultimately drive them back to that website. So um, right there, we're, we're taking, it's, it's a CPM approach as a CPC. So CPM is a cost per thousand, CPC is cost per click. So with that CPM approach in our team and what makes us a little bit different than a lot of uh, agencies out there is I've got a team of operators that are pulling the, the levers inside, looking at these bids, looking at these keywords and making sure that we're optimizing on a day-to-day -day basis to hit these really niche customers in real time. Love it. Who are, um, Chris, ideal clients for you? Man, that's a great question. All of them? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but really, I, I think any person, because we've worked with, from down to minor league baseball, to some really, really big Fortune 500 companies um, on the CPG side that you know, know what they're doing, but then again, they don't know how to do it per se. So um, the ideal client, I guess, would be a brand or a product uh, or company that has a team that needs help with this space or somebody that is, is really just starting out. They're looking to, they know that they've got a budget first and foremost. They're post-startup. They, they know that they need to utilize this marketing uh, atmosphere out here in this digital space. How do we do it? That's where we want to come in and be that strategist for them. So uh, we've really seen it uh, work out well with developing brands from the nuts and bolts up. We're working with this really, really cool um, app called GigPro. And so what they are is they are a application in the food and bev space that if you're a server or somebody that works in a kitchen, and you need money really quickly and you need to pick up a shift, it's kind of like the Uber for that. And that's what we're trying to make them. And that's their goal. So they started in Charleston and now we've evolved to Charlotte and Nashville. Um, so helping them with, mm. you know, developing that, that strategy to how do we get to every person that is in the food and bev space in Charleston, which is massive. How do we hit these, these line cooks? How do we hit these bartenders to let them know, Hey, you know, the bar down the street needs somebody tomorrow night, like ASAP. And, and if you've been to any restaurant lately, it is, it is rough out there. So this app is taken off at the right time. And so we've helped them from the creative and branding aspect of their, their brand to the uh, strategy of getting it out there. And again, it's, it's just targeting those individuals in, in real time. So that's a really fun company. And then on the flip side, going into some of these larger companies that, for example, one of these uh, large CPG vacuum cleaner brands that we work with, um, they were doing long form TV uh, up a year and a half ago. And if you know what long form TV is at three in the morning or six in the morning, when you get up, you're watching commercials. Our ad, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've had uh, interviewed Ron Popeil. I don't know if you know who Ron Popeil is, but he was one of the infomercial kings early on yeah. who is, I don't know if he's credited, but wait, there's more. So I totally, okay. yeah. So well, I, I'm not that. trying to poo-poo long-form TV. I just think there's an effective way now. To oh yeah, totally. In front of individuals, so I could help him get in front of those people. No, but um, so this brand, they were basically using our 30-minute to hour-long spots, and again, running them at times where people probably aren't watching TV. So we said, hey, let's run a test. Give us that budget, and let's take this and go after individuals that are in market for vacuums. Let's go after your competitors. Let's find individuals that are out searching the masses in Amazon, Walmart, Target, all of the big brick and mortar places. Um, and let's serve these messages and condensed video ads to them in real time. Knocked it out of the park. That led to a, a that was just a branding and awareness campaign. So for us, it was fun to be able to come in with a, a brand that even in COVID, they had a marketing team. They were a very talented marketing team, but they just weren't 
adapt or educate. They were focused on one of the channels. Yeah, absolutely. And then they had some teams that were running Amazon and, and Walmart and stuff. But from a broader standpoint of where the masses are streaming and consuming media, that's where they needed our help. And so those those are some of the best uh, instances of where I think we really shine um, as a company um, to be able to come in and, and really make an impact. Mm, love it. I want to talk, Chris, about, you know, I know it's not public knowledge right now, but by the time this comes out, it will be that you and the company made the Inc. 5000. Congratulations on that. And I want to talk about some of the or some of the inflection points along the way that you see stood out milestones, either milestones that were challenging times that then you were able to turn around and or, um, you know, just turning points in hiring or in the business itself. What are some of the milestones along this this journey so far? Yeah, no, thank you. And um, it's it's crazy to, to, to think that we are at this level, but it is also, I, I, I see it because every day I can, I look out my door and see the machine rolling because of, of our hard work over the last seven years. And I guess um, real quick to, to kind of go back full circle, you know, Digital Ignite's been around since 2018. Um, and, and my business partners, Ed Seeger and Mike Samet um, have been, uh, you know, with me along the, the, the way. Mike and I actually uh, were with New Point Digital, which is a digital marketing company owned by a really large radio conglomerate here in Charleston called Apex Media. Mike and I came together as I was the tech nerd, Mike was the sales juggernaut. We came together and, and really formed this amazing company, brand, whatever you want to call it, um, off the heels of this radio station, you know, a radio conglomerate. Now, back seven, eight years ago, we were like the redheaded stepchild. They would sit, they would monetize the radio budget before digital, and it was always clashing. They'd say, hey, let's do this huge radio buy. And oh, by the way, on the way out, here's this digital pamphlet. And then Mike and I would go pick up the scraps, you know, and so, but we knew that we were building something great because we could see how everybody else was selling digital, which was they were selling a package and outsourcing it to New York, DC, LA, some of the major agencies at the time that were doing programmatic. Um, the benefits of us being able to see that were we were doing programmatic, which um, if you're not familiar with what programmatic is, it's a made up word, not now, but it was 10, 15 years ago, but it means to buy and trade media in real time. And so programmatic is, is a massive weapon in the digital space right now. And seven years, six years ago, when we were at New Point, um, we were one of the, the first companies, at least in, in our area, that were doing any of this in-house. So like I said, most of us, or most of the agencies were outsourcing it. We brought the engine in. And so we partnered with a company out of London called Admito at the time. And they were just trying to come into America to, to, to test, their, test the waters, see if they could sell this platform here. And so we were their guinea pig in a way. And so we went to the clients out here and really introduced them to this programmatic space. And right away, the benefits of that were cheaper prices at CPMs because everybody was outsourcing and that middleman had to get the cut. So for us, since we were doing it in house, we were able to provide that that cheaper price. And unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, back in the day, there was no strategy. It was really just like, I mean, there was strategy, but it was really a race to the bottom of who could sell the cheapest CPM for the most amount of impressions. Well, over time, you realize like, okay, there's so many different layers in how we want to target individuals and impressions, and just serving a massive amount of impressions might not be the main benefit of it. But we really cut our teeth. Um, with Edmito, and that allowed us to expand into just being able to work with major players in the space, whether that's Trade Desk, um, Tube Mobile at the time, which is now um, Adobe. Adobe actually bought them. Uh, worked with App Nexus, that's Xander. We worked with DataZoo, that's Roku now. Um, so what we wanted to do was build a fully agnostic platform to where we could go to all of these major players and go to a client and have a CNA with them and really understand what they needed and then go back and then pair the strategies based on saying, hey, here's a package, this is what you should be doing. So right there was the biggest game changer for us. And so we just started to evolve from there. And 2018, we had the opportunity to buy New Point. Um, the gentleman that, was, uh, that owned the radio stations sold his radio stations to Saga Media for a, a, a pretty penny. 
Um, Mike and I were able to partner with Ed Seeger, who is our, our, our business partner now. And we've taken Digital Ignite from, from we, I think we had about a million dollars on the books uh, at that time to last year, we did about 10 million, you know? And so this year we're on pace to do 20 million, which is, is insane. And so coming off a, a pandemic, we really grew because we saw all of these brands that we actually, we knew this was going to come at some point. We knew majority of these companies needed to hit the digital side of things a little bit harder on their media, their media budgets, but COVID just expedited that, you know, everybody needed to hit these people because they're at home and what were they doing? They were on their laptops, their smart TVs, their cell phones. So we really evolved um, over the last couple of years into, into, again, I think a leader in the space of educating um, clients and brands, but also showing results because transparency is king nowadays. Once you give a, a client a taste of, of showing them a little bit of that reporting, they want more. And then it's like, oh my gosh, you can show me this CPA. You can show me that, that return of investment. Like, gimme, gimme, gimme. You have a dashboard that I can log into 24 seven and I can see at three in the morning, what's going on. Gimme, 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 which we do. Um, so we've really tried to evolve to a, um, again, a full service agency, but in modern times. Um, and I think uh, going back to your question of some like key points and hires, we've taken our lumps along the way. And I think anybody will. We're, we're, we're at year three plus now. I think the first year with any company, it, it, first starting out, you're trying to grab the bull by the horns and you're getting jarred around and you're trying to make sure that this train doesn't fall off the tracks. And we, we were in that space. You know, We brought our book of business over and, and really honed in on the spaces that we were really popular in or really successful in, which were uh, education, CPG, and automotive at the time. Um, but we really grew from that and, and learned. And by year two, um, Mike Samet did an amazing job of revamping our sales side of things. So we've, we've just brought in uh, leaders in, in the space and, and formed department heads. So we've got a sales department head. We've got an awesome marketing and account management team. We've got a, a great operations team. We have a creative team. Um, that's a big thing right there. Creative on top of digital now. Um, you can see all of the data in real time. So and on top of your media informed strategies, you can inform creative now. So we were leaving so much money on the table on the creative side that we've brought in a creative department for that too. So that's really allowed us to get to this level of Inc. 5000 and allowed us to, to work from the river dogs down to some of these really big Fortune 500 brands. First of all, Chris, amazing. Congratulations on this journey. I love hearing your advice. You're so good at explaining very difficult to understand or industry stuff and boil it down to uh, so people can understand it like me. So I appreciate that. I think I just want to thank you. I encourage everyone to check out digital-ignite.com to check out what they're doing. Um, some amazing stuff. And I think, you know, data transparency is king is what is kind of what you're saying here. And I love what you guys do. So check that out. Ch check out other episodes of inspiredinsider.com. And, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out.